Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Profs Workshop of Behind the Curtain. My name is Laura Zableet, and I work in the Arts Engagement Department of the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. And all year round, we have citywide arts programming to share creative experiences and opportunities with our many San Diego communities. And right now, since the theater building is closed, and we're all trying to stay physically isolated, we're still trying to stay artistically and community connected with our online community. So Behind the Curtain is a theater production workshop series that's live streamed on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. right here on our Facebook page. And each week we connect with a different designer from a theater design discipline, whether it's lighting like last week with the amazing Heather Reynolds or costuming or sound, or like we're doing today, props. So this is our second episode and this is our props workshop. So thank you very much for joining us again. If you didn't see last week's workshop, go ahead and check it out on our page, still there. Um, but thank you for joining us again today. So we're gonna spend this workshop talking all about the world of props. What is a prop? If you were the prop designer for a professional theater production, what would that mean? And what would you actually be doing? How does somebody become a professional prop designer? What are some of the skills that you would need if you were gonna do that? And how can you practice those skills right now in your home today? And then maybe how might those same skills carry into other parts of your life? Those are some of the questions that we're gonna explore today along with trying out a prop making activity that you can do right now with whatever you have around you. We'll also have some time to answer any questions that you have for our guest artist today. So drop any questions in the comments section before the end. You can do that anytime during the workshop, but make sure you get those in there. This is an opportunity to speak directly with an industry professional. Uh, I'm also so excited to tell you that in addition to our props guest artist today, we have another surprise guest. Not really a surprise. We did put her information in the caption, but I'm gonna, for dramatic effect, we have a surprise guest who will join us in a bit here. So be sure to stick around to meet one of our San Diego community partners who's gonna come on to do an, a little activity together. I will also say, if your birthday is in March or in April, and you're in quarantine to celebrate your birthday, stick around because we may be having a little celebration for you toward the end, okay? But if you wanna contribute and participate in today's workshop, what things you might wanna have around you if you have them are some scratch paper, maybe one of those uh, brochures that continue to come in the mail, even in this moment, uh, some scissors, some uh, tape, a rubber band if you have one, if you have a balloon or a latex glove, a silicone glove, we're not going to destroy it. We want to make sure not to um, make it unusable for medical purposes, but uh, also if you have an empty pill bottle with a lid, uh, we can use those a little bit later to make our own at-home props. So get those together if you don't have them yet. So without further ado, I am honored to welcome our prop designer, guest artist, Dave Buis here today. So Dave is the prop director here at the Old Globe. And before this, he was the prop master in all three theaters of the Old Globe and Balboa Park. Because we have one big main stage theater, a smaller in the round theater, and then also an outdoor summertime stage. He was the prop, ma he was the prop master of all three of those different spaces. Uh, he got a Bachelor of Fine Arts with an emphasis in sculpture, and today he's going to lead us through what it means to create props in a theater. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Hi, Laura. It's good to be here, and thank you. <laughs> it's very, very good to have you. Thank you so much. Before we talk about any of the other things, I want to do a check-in in the way that we would normally do a check-in at the beginning of each workshop. If it were in person, if we had a room full of people, we'll do it the same even though it's just you and me right now. Um, and so the way that we'll do this check-in is in the style of one of our amazing partners, Project Aware, uh, led by Reginald Washington. So what we'll do, Dave, is we'll share our name, even though it's only two of us and we both know each other, so we're gonna share our name. And then we will each share one word that describes how we are feeling. And that seems pretty simple, right? It's pretty straightforward, except there are some catches. So some things that are off limits are words like good, fine, all right, and okay, because those tend to be more masking words that aren't actually describing how we're feeling. And we're also uh, gonna avoid 
physical words such as I'm tired or I'm hungry that again tend to be more masking about how we're really feeling. Does that sound all right with you? Yep. Okay, you wanna go first? Okay, so I'm David and I'm excited. Lovely, I'm Laura and I am, I am jittery if truth be told, because <laughs> I think it's a combination of excitement and coffee, but uh, <laughs> coffee is a physical thing. So maybe I'll just stick with excited then and great. We'll be a prop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Dave, I'm so grateful that you're here. I know that there's a lot going on that you're working on. Um, yesterday, you were working on some prop related stuff. Would you want to share about what, what's going on with you? Yeah, a lot of us, I mean, right now it's definitely a weird time, but um, being around a bunch of creative and talented um, and uh, adaptable people, we were looking at how we can actually support our essential workers and uh, mm. taking a look at just how we can help create PPE for those workers. So whether it be mask making um, or other things that we could uh, create. So. That's what I've. Uh, that's what we've been working on. <laughs> hey, it's like yeah. real life props, real yeah. in real time and, and played out in real life. That's really uh, wonderful. So thank you for sharing some of your time with us, and thank you also for using your creative skills to support the community in a whole other way at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot of things that we want to talk about today. <laughs> but first, before we go any further, could you please define what is a prop for us? What is a prop in the world of theater? Well, within this, the, I mean, a prop is basically anything that um, an actor is going to handle or deal uh -huh. with in stage, or it can be part of the set. Um, a good antidote for describing what a prop is, mm -hmm. is imagine uh, moving into a new home. So okay. you have everything in, the, in a moving van. You're getting to this empty home that has its doors, its windows, mm -hmm. its own plumbing. Um, and so if you're looking at that empty home, that is your set. And okay. then you walking into that empty home, the clothes you're wearing, the accessories you have, uh, those are the costumes. And then okay. we can look at you yourself um, in that home as the actor. So everything else that's sitting on the curb in that moving van is a prop. And oh. that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that is that's a lot. That's a lot of different kinds of things. That's so cool, though. I've never heard somebody use that metaphor before. That's really helpful. Yeah. Um, is it always that straightforward, though? Because I know that that metaphor in my head, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I know exactly what a prop is now. But is there a gray area that ever comes up as, as, as far as knowing what is a prop in your own work? Always. So a lot of the, I mean, the one thing, the joys of working in theater is it's a, collabor uh, a collaboration. And so it means that there's many departments that are coming together to create these things and props fall in that because you have mm -hmm. props that need electrics, you have props that need sound effects, mm -hmm. you have props that create effects, or you have props that are tied in closely with the costume um, and tied in closely with the set. So it is collaborative in every sense of the word. How can we, so we have an activity, right? Can we jump right into yes. that to try to do a little test? Yes, yeah. we're going to jump into prop or not. All right. So everybody at home, I know that people who are under 18 have gotten into distance learning right now. And we have some distance learning for our at-home workshop participants. The prop quiz. So I hope you, you study <laughs> because the stakes are very high and it's very important that you do well on this. Um, Dave, how do, we, how do we do this prop quiz? So basically, we're going to put up a photo. And um, that's going to show um, an object. Uh, and basically, the viewers at home can comment. Uh, we'll give a little bit of lag time and um, comment whether you think it's a prop or not. And okay. uh, then Laura will, we will go ahead and answer the question. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. OK, I'm ready. I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> All right, All right. Can we see the first one? So our first mm -hmm. photo here is swords and knives. We have two katanas, two size, and two knives. Now, is it a prop or is it not? Uh, okay, well, you were talking about props being things that actors handle. Mm -hmm. So we definitely would handle, if I was in a show and I was using those things, I would definitely handle them. They don't seem like uh, decorations. So I would guess that these are definitely a prop. 
but uh, anybody comment below. And I believe that Dave is underneath me on the screen. So I'll say, I'll gesture towards Dave. <laughs> say, What's the Any verdict, bus? Dave? Is it a prop <laughs> or is it not? <laughs> Um, this one is um, a prop, but something okay. to consider when we're talking about these, um, like a katana or the size and even the knives, where do they go on the actor? Um, if they're on the side, on their hip, then they need a holder created yeah. for that. And this yeah. is where that teamwork, uh, that collaboration comes in, where we have to work with the costume shop and the costume designer to mm -hmm. create that um, element. So, oh, so the holster might be a costume piece and the weapon itself might be on a prop table backstage. Correct. Oh, cool. And, and I just realized the prop table, could you just tell us what a prop table is real quick, Dave? Yes, um, a prop table basically is something that um, is, is a location backstage where the actor knows that they can find their object, their prop, um, um, before they go onto the show. So we have tables set up that have are clearly marked and that actor can rely that their object is gonna be there when they need to be on stage and then they will take it, so. All right, okay, so there we go. Our first one, it was a prop, there goes the verdict. Let's see the next one. Ooh. So the, what we have in front, we're, we're calling these the shoulder bags. Um, these were, or this was a prop that was used in our show, Almost Famous. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing about this photo is that um, within it, we have um, Cameron Crowe's actual bag that he had as a kid. We have the movie prop bag that was um, in the film. And then we have the bag that we created for our stage production. That's so, so okay. Yeah. So for anybody who who just is not familiar with Almost Famous, um, it it was a, originally a book, right? That that was created into a movie, and then we did a show of it at the Old Globe uh, last season, which was super cool. Um, so it's still cool that there are all three of those bags. Well, my my guess is that because in the last picture, the holster was a costume piece and the sword was a prop. Uh, folks at home, comment what you think is the correct choice and and uh, present an argument if you disagree. But I would say that these bags are all costume pieces. What's the verdict, Dave? Um, I might've spoiled it, um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, they, in this situation, they were a prop. So um, the bag is a recreation of something that was um, separate from the costume. At times, we will collaborate with the costume mm. department because there may be a unique element or a color scheme that we want to tie in with the costume. Right. But um, this bag also had to open up and dump its contents. So it um, meant that it, it was a, a hand prop that was carried and then it was a prop that actually functioned um, with an effect so that the actor could pull a string and the contents would actually pull, fall out of it. Oh, that's so cool. That's like special effects on stage. Okay, that's interesting. Cause I, now I see why, especially if there's something inside the bag that needs to do something other than just be a fashion statement that might move away from being costume. But um, yeah. anyway, people online are saying props and or, or a costume and I guess prop in this case, that's cool. Yep. All right, let's see the next one. All right, so the next one, we have a parasol. Yeah. And um, basically, I mean, it's a straightforward picture, but what do you guys think? Is it a prop or not? Okay, uh, parasol. <laughs> See, I would think that since I could set it down, I could leave it behind. I don't need to come on stage with it necessarily. I would think it's a prop because it's handled. Although parasols are, um, they're not very useful because in theory, their only purpose would be to protect from the sun, but they're so small. And then there's a lot of holes in them. So I would think that they're all more of a fashion item actually in that case and less utilitarian. So I will say that a parasol would be a costume, uh, but comment if you think differently, but Dave, what's the verdict? Uh, the verdict is it is a costume. Okay. So. 
you'll see this even in prop text. Uh, the parasol itself is, it ties in a lot with costumes typically, mm -hmm. um, whether it be the color of the handle, the color of the fabric, the lace, the, um, that material can tie mm -hmm. in closer to um, the actor that's using it. Whereas an umbrella is more of a manufactured accessory that can be what it is and then brought on by an actor. So an umbrella would be a prop, the parasol would be a costume. Oh, that's so cool. That's a funny distinction. So that shows up in props textbook sometimes? Yes, there's a, you'll find it in a couple uh, published articles. <laughs> that's so funny. Okay, cool. Thank you for testing us on something household so that we all know the textbook right answer to something <laughs> about props. Um, okay, let's see the next one. Ooh, is so that a real this, motorcycle? Uh, yes, in a way. Um, <laughs> So th this is a photo of a motorcycle and um, this is a large item. So basically, yeah. what, would you think of it as a prop or would you think of this as something that's not? Uh, okay. It's handled, but it's also sat on. And when things are set, if it was something like furniture, I would have in the past thought that that would be a set piece if people aren't picking it up and moving it around. However, Dave, when you said that when we move into the house, there's not already furniture in there, so maybe the furniture would be a prop. And I suppose you could put a motorcycle in a moving van. <laughs> <laughs> but then I also think about how that motorcycle might have a light on the front of it, and that might be the lighting department, or the sound of a motorcycle that might involve sound design. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's set set design because it's big and sort of it's, it seems bigger than a parasol. So my, I'm going to say set design, but what, what's the final verdict here? In this one, the, the final was it's a prop. So, okay. um, but uh, you're right to, I mean, if this was actually connected to the deck and we had, mm -hmm. to, we had to move it um, scenically, mm -hmm. um, then mm -hmm. there could be a bridge between um, whether props would build it and then scenic would install it. Um, but Ooh. in this Ooh. case, this was a, a motorcycle that was in Almost Famous that the actor had to freely ride across the stage. And the trick with this prop is you don't want a real motorcycle sitting backstage, one, creating its own sound before it comes on, and mm. um, also outputting a lot of exhaust into an enclosed space. Oh. So we had to be very creative and resourceful and um, actually convert an electric bike into what looked like a time specific motorcycle. So. That's so cool. And it seems like everybody online knew that that was a prop. So everybody at home, good Kudos. job. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna take your lead next time. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Let's, what is our next one? All right, so the Ooh. next one, this is a shot of As You Like It, um, mm -hmm. and we're looking at a painting. Prop or not? Can I ask a question, a clarifying question? Always, yes. <laughs> <laughs> did it move during the show? Um, this piece actually did move up and down stage. Oh. But that's interesting because then I would think that if, even if it moved up and down stage, it's so large that probably did the actors move it? That's another clarifying question. No, the scene, the uh, it was automated. So the scenery department moved, um, rigged it so that it could move. Mm -hmm. Well, you said the scenery department rigged it and moved it and people online are saying scenery and I am, I am saying the same thing. My guess is that that is not a prop. That is a set piece. What's the verdict? You are correct. Um, this is such a large piece. I mean, you're you're basically looking at a decorated wall. Yeah. Um, the one thing that was awesome about this piece is that it, it shows another collaboration between our department and scenic, and scenic where the molding that's at the top and at the yeah. corners, um, we have a sculptor that was able to sculpt those um, beautiful pieces, and then we were able to cast that and and, and apply it. So. Um, mm the talent between our departments is really able to support each other and and add details to this so, so cool another moment of collaboration across departments and it seems like props you do that a lot specifically yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay let's that was awesome let's see the next one 
Ooh, okay. What was that from a particular show? What is that? Um, this one was this one was from a production called They Promised Her the Moon. And this is a period microphone. So um, would this be a prop or would this be sound? Proper okay. not. I feel like I'm cheating by asking clarifying questions, but did it work? Did an actor actually speak into it? And did that specific microphone amplify their voice? Yes. And you can actually in the photo you can you can see um, a transmitter um, within it. Okay. <laughs> I write in the comments. It looks like folks are are weighing in. I my instinct is definitely that it's sound, but it's also handled. Okay, people online are saying prop now, and people online seem to be have a better track record with this than I. So I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm going to go with the viewers at home and I'm going to, oh, guess what? Okay. So one of our amazing, it seems like somebody who works at the Old Globe Boy Trust very much has said sound. So even though I was about to go with everybody else and say prop, I now say sound. Okay. That's my final answer. What's the verdict, Dave? Um, can I say both? <laughs> yes. That's, that's the best case scenario. Then we're all right. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, this is tagging on to that collaboration. The the yeah. look of the microphone, um, when we go to a period piece or a time specific piece, um, yeah. that most, most of the times would be a prop. Um, okay. The fact that uh, we have a microphone that's actually shoved into this period looking microphone, okay. um, it means that there's a really close connection with the sound department and um, taking their gear and putting it inside of mm. a prop. Um, mm. We do that a lot of times with old radios, old um, jukeboxes, things like that. So, oh, right. right. This oh, is neat. It's kind of like that. the motorcycle taking some like a different, different hardware, sticking it inside something else to keep yeah. telling the story while making it functional for the actors and what they need to do as opposed to having a very old microphone that might not be as reliable or do what you need it to do in the context of sound design yeah you definitely you definitely have to it, being a prop person means that you know how to take things apart and put mm -hmm. them back to be back <laughs> together i mean there was a time during one production where i had to take a dust buster and they wanted it to not generate as much sound on stage but make it look like the actor was still using it so I was able to take it apart, remove the fan, and but still you could still power it on, and you could hear the servo moving. So it sounded like a quieter dustbuster. Oh my uh, goodness! Did it still work without the fan? It wouldn't without the fan. It wouldn't suck up anything. But at least the actor, you didn't. The audience couldn't see the actor not sucking up anything. So great, great. It worked out great. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I think I've babysat a lot of future prop masters who really like taking things apart. I think we're working up to like the, the putting things back together part, but <laughs> <laughs> if that's the characteristic of, of a prop master, got a lot of those. Um, okay, so let's see the next one. This one I really like. This one was, okay. well, in this prediction or in this photo, you see a lot of different elements of yeah. uh, theater craft. But we're going to focus on the lamp, the hanging lanterns, and the wreath for this okay. photo. And this is this is on the Christmas show, the Ebenezer Scrooge's big San Diego Christmas show. Okay, and that was in our our small in the round, smaller in the round theater. Um, so the light lanterns. Okay, I I'm no fool. I am learning that the answer is multiple things sometimes with this world of collaboration and, and different artists supporting each other and each other's storytelling through their own modes of storytelling. So I'm sure that lighting was involved. And I'm also sure that the props team created those lanterns and then removed whatever was inside and put in new machinery on the inside to make it work. And it seems, uh, that's my final answer. I'm just going to pretty confidently say that. But what's the verdict? Right in between. You're correct. I mean, it, it is a great example of collaboration uh, where uh, we have bought the wreath and um, Electrix was able to add um, lights to the, to the outside of it. The lanterns right. we did um, either gut and put in and then Electrix put in their own elements into it. Um, mm. But it's it's very similar to that microphone um, image mm. 
where you take a time specific object and then yeah. we make it so that we can control um, the electrical element that's in it. Huh. So. so so in that case, uh, some folks online were writing that that could be seam design because it is, because if it's lighting and if it's there the whole time, I do think about how there's already, there are already lighting fixtures in a home sometimes that are more mm -hmm. permanent. Uh, would, did the scenic department, was, uh, was the scenic department part of that collaboration at all or how would you speak to that? The scene, uh, scenery department is, um, which is another reason this photo is a great um, example. The scenery department in this case actually rigged it so that it's hanging. Oh, um, oh okay. So you have, you have multiple departments coming together to go, okay, this is the look that we wanna generate. Props department, mm -hmm. build that look. Scenery, we want it to hang at these different levels, um, rig that, and, mm -hmm. and then electrics, we would need to get this to light up this way. Now, when you're talking about in a design element, whether mm -hmm. you have a specific prop designer or scenic designer, um, yes, the scenic designer or the prop designer will, will collaborate um, or the scenic, in a lot of cases, it's just a scenic designer. They will give that overall look and mm -hmm. then we will work within those parameters to, to support that look. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and we have like really active, passionate involvement from viewers online. So thank you for participating <laughs> I'm sure in this we game. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a couple more things that we want to make sure we, we speak through before we have our special guest come on stage. Um, mm -hmm. But that was that was the last of our prop quiz, right? We're done with the prop quiz. Hey, yeah. thank you, thank you, our wonderful prop teacher. <laughs> um, so it seems like there are a lot of different kinds of props and some it might be tricky to categorize but are there main categories of props that are kind of rules of thumb i think the two if anything that i, I would want people to take away today is basically the two category main two categories hand props and set props okay. and so and we can jump in breaking down the hand props um, a hand prop is anything that the actor is going to interact with anything they're going to hold um, carry interact with this could be things from a book to a skull to a lighter. I mean, it, it, it really is um, all over the board. But, um, and within these categories, there are subcategories that I'm, people will, who are in theater will recognize like costume props, uh, personal mm -hmm. props, consumable mm -hmm. food, um, and practicals like fr a flashlight, breakaways. Um, so there's there's really a lot that an actor will deal with in a show. And if you're at home and you're watching and you want to know more about these categories, there are some extra resources that Dave recommended uh, that are in the caption of this video. So don't let your research end here. We're just doing an introductory workshop. Yes. Um, so we have our, our hand props and our set props. And uh, when you first get assigned to a project, let's say from the moment you receive the email or you get the call that you're working on a show, what does your process look like, Dave? Our, uh, so really my process would start with the script. Um, so mm -hmm. we, we need the story obviously to, to start from, so that we're all starting from the same point. And then um, we, would we would gather together so that we can be on the same page as the director um, that director is really going to give us our framework um, and our direction. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to sit together um, with the other designers so that we all understand how we can support each other and the vision that we're going for. Mm -hmm. And so once you have that framework, then um, myself or my team will, will gather together and then we want to start breaking down um, what those props are in the show. Mm -hmm. And then once we've established that, and a lot of the times it's, I mean, again, with the collaborations, we have a great stage management team. And so mm -hmm. the stage management team is also dissecting the scripts and um, putting out paperwork that shows us these are the prop lists that we all see that we're going to need in the show. Yeah, yeah. And I, so I want to really go into a lot of paperwork. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the finished product is is a really real world with some that's so detailed. And we have a, a picture of the Jitney, uh, some props from our a show Jitney by August Wilson that uh, was on our Old Globe main stage, uh, directed by Ruben Santiago Hudson. Could we pull that photo up of the the Jitney fridge? Yeah, this is a this is a good example of of something that's going to be interacted with, and then also. Yeah 
so this ties to the the categories we were talking about and that we'll refer right. to and um and this is more so on the set props this, yeah. this set yeah. was a fantastic example of uh, really good set dressing down to yeah. period um, baseball cards that were accurate so it was yeah. it was a beautiful set to look at I remember seeing at one point one of the characters sweeping the floor and there was actual dust that was set on the floor and that must was that yeah. a prop <laughs> yeah that our our prop master had to actually um, set peanut shells and and um, detritus around the set so that when wow. we came back at, into act two when you saw that character sweeping up um, you'd see that that dust and and then the the trick was rigging the trash can so that when they took the trash to the trash can it went into a bag and so you had the um, trash in that bag and then mm -hmm. when another act actor put a magazine into the trash he was putting it in the other compartment i did not notice that at all there were two separate compartments in that trash can yeah <laughs> that's so cool so you just don't have to cycle through the magazine a million times you can use the same one that's so cool i had no idea yeah that was an amazing show yes. um i love the set dressing and Everett prop dressing for all of that uh i think our next photo is kind of illuminating those lists that you were talking about, right, Dave? Yeah, so, I mean, basically when, I mean, it, what we have in front of us now is an example of, of really where we, the raw look at um, build, pull, buy um, mm -hmm. lists. And um, some of the photos that you'll see on this list are things that we have in stock that we know that we can use. Um, so that would go into a, a pull category where, okay. Okay. And we, yeah, when you're looking at a, a build, pro, a build, pull, buy, a lot of these um, sections will cross over. Mm. But um, focusing mm. on the pull section, when you have access to a warehouse um, or a great stock like we do at the Globe, mm -hmm. we're able to pull um, some of the furniture that we have and then either adapt it or um, modify it to uh, conform to the set needs. Um, sometimes it's perfect and we can just put it right on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have, when you realize that you need a, a, a computer to use for a scene, you could either buy it or you could pull it from a warehouse or you could build it or maybe buy it and then change the background, have a different logo or something like that. Those are the three categories. Correct. And it's, it really is, this is another section where you have to be versatile because you may, like you said, it may be cheaper to buy um, a, a computer from a Goodwill store that's broken, but we can take it, rip out the guts, put in a false screen and, mm. um, and then control what it's going to show um, the audience. And so that's a mix where we have the buy section and the build section together. Yeah. Um, other times, I'm Oh, go ahead. No, no, you. Um, oh, I was going to say a lot of the times, I mean, there's there's moments we have a great build team um, mm -hmm. at the Globe. And so a lot of the time is um, it's actually easier to just build something from scratch than trying to modify. Um, like when you want to build an antique table um, that's specific to certain dimensions, it, yeah. it's easier to draw on the talent that you have. Um, well, that, that, I mean, I'm noticing so many themes of resourcefulness and, and the ability to build things with what you have around, which brings us to our, our next activity kind of, but I also, when we're talking about being resourceful with what you have around you, something that you mentioned to me the other day is that you have the ability to work from home, so to speak, right? Like as a, as a props designer, as long as you have tools, you could create things wherever you are with whatever you have around you. Yes, I mean, being a, a props person, it's you, you, you learn to adapt to different um, build environments. Because sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a set that I built um, and propped that I had to basically build on a donor patio and then load it into the theater. So it, it's you're, you're making, you're making, you're working with a toolkit that is very versatile mm -hmm. and that is transportable. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Um, like, and some of those tools, I mean, I have, I mean, like everything from a drill gun mm -hmm. to your tape measure, a Leatherman is always um, necessary in anything you're doing in theater. You have um, them all around you at home right now to make a whole bunch of fun things. 
<laughs> oh yes, I see hand props and everything hey. behind me is separate. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's lovely. Um, so I want to take a quick moment to remind folks that if you have any questions about anything that you're hearing, go ahead and put those in the comment section so that we can get to them at the very end of this workshop. But Dave, we're about ready to put into play that resourcefulness and creativity that we've been talking about. Uh, so it's time to welcome that special guest that we've been talking about today. So we do behind the curtain all over San Diego with our community partners. And one community partner is the San Diego USO, where Idabel Gutierrez is a field program specialist and an incredible collaborator, supporter, and patron of the theater arts. So I'm so excited to welcome you to our live stream, Idabel. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to get to see you and to get to have you join us for this, for this activity. Um, okay. And also, Idabel, this is Dave. Dave, this is Idabel. <laughs> Hi, Dave. <laughs> um, Hi, I want to, real quick, before we do our hands-on activity, I would love to ask you both kind of the same question. Um, and I'll ask you, Idabel, first. But could you share real quick how you got involved with the theater through the Old Globe? I started three years ago with another community partner that I had. My first show was Benny June, and I just mm. went there. Oh, and then from there, you, you've done behind the curtain a couple of times. You are yeah. a seasoned professional. You've been around for <laughs> the old globe longer than I have. <laughs> yeah, so I've done Globe for All, uh, behind the curtain workshops, your dinner and shows, and I'm also a volunteer now, and I try to go to your shows with the discounts you have on your website. That's so awesome. And yeah, we, I'm so happy that you're, you're on board with us as a volunteer. And if anybody at home is thinking about volunteering in the future, once we can all go back into the buildings, Got to join Ida Bell, superstar community partner. Um, so, and also, could I ask you, Ida Bell, now that you're you're working with the USO and with military families, what is the value of theater that you see for military communities specifically? Um, when I was a military, when I, I'm a military spouse, so when I first got interacted with the whole globe, it was while my husband was deployed, and then in doing so, I got to meet new people, make new friends, and my love for all the gold globe now well we're so happy to have you and and now dave i know that you kind of have some similar experience but would you also share how you got involved in theater and uh and how your experience your personal experiences has shaped that as well yeah I, it's it's interesting because the the i had a similar experience growing up as being a navy brat mm -hmm. and um the lessons that you learn as being a Navy brat, um, a lot are learning to make friends fast and also um, knowing that goodbye is not forever. And so those were a lot of traits that one, once I got into the theater, I was like, wow, it's, it really kind of conditioned me for this work. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah. a lot of, I mean, a lot of the path, and I hear this a lot with uh, people within theater, it's that first show that you went to that really was like the gateway. And uh, for me, it was Annie as a young kid. It was, that was the oh. first musical I saw. And then uh, Man of La Mancha, which was amazing at the Civic Theater. The drawbridge came down and I was hooked. And, <laughs> um, and I mean, through you ask people how they got into the profession, it's always a roundabout way. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, was, an, I was going into animation and then gallery design and sculpture and um thankfully came back and found a wonderful uh, spot in props so yeah well it worked out for for all of us i'm glad that we're all here and we're all engaging in the theater and in the arts as a community um and so as a way to also help to celebrate our community our next activity will be to create something to help celebrate everyone's birthday who's had to celebrate their birthdays during a time of social distancing so if you're at home and your birthday's in March or April or who knows how, you know, May, I don't want to even speculate, but, uh, but we want to celebrate your birthday. We can't be with you in person, but if you're at home and you're looking for a way to celebrate somebody's birthday, we're going to create some birthday confetti mini cannons to help celebrate all together. So this is the time to get together those craft materials that we talked about at the beginning, your scissors, your shirts that nobody needs to go through right now, an old pill bottle and something stretchy, either a balloon or a latex glove that we're not going to rip or damage, and a rubber band. Yeah, did we get everything, Dave? Yep. All right, cool. We're good to go. 
So the three of us are going to make it together. And Dave, Dave promised that he could make props in 15 minutes. That's the challenge that he'd had to do in the past in order to get a prop on stage within 15 minutes very rapidly. So we're going to try to make something even faster than that today. What's our first step? What should we do? So our first step, let's take the, the pill bottle that you have. And um, what we want to do first is take um, either a scissors. If you have a mat knife at home, um, it may be easier to cut through this. But And this is the one part of the project that I'm like, please, everybody be careful uh, where your hands are. But you're going to cut the bottom um, of the pill bottle uh, okay. uh, so that we can remove that completely. All right. I, uh, I wanted to make sure that my scissors would cut through the plastic. So I actually already cut off the bottom of it. I cheated. I didn't mean to cheat, <laughs> but I'm done with that step. <laughs> I'm just glad your fingers are safe. <laughs> Me too, but this workshop is geared towards folks who are 18 and up, so we're, we're pretty good. Perfect. <laughs> Yay! And I see that Idabel got hers off. And Yay. so the next the next step, we're gonna go ahead and take that lid off. Okay. And we don't need that. Now, uh, within this project, um, we can do this different ways because at this point, we're looking at um, the balloon or the glove, um, the elastic, um, part that we're going to apply. If you okay. don't have any of those, um, what you can do is you can create a hole in the lid and um, we can use that so that um, instead of pulling, you're going to basically make a blow dart out of it <laughs> and blow confetti everywhere. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I have a, a glove, so I'm oops, fixing it to the top with a, a rubber band. Idabel, what are you working with? Hey, you got a hole in the center. <laughs> so okay. I'm gonna do the I'm gonna do the balloon while you since you have the glove. Okay. And what okay. I've done is I've I've tied a knot um, with the balloon. Okay, I can do that. I can tie a knot with a thumb. If you want to, the um, the, the glove, the glove. Um, I wanted to make sure that you could keep it so that um, if you need to use the glove again, um, yeah. you can. Yeah. And stuff. then you're basically pulling it over the top lid. And what's nice about these pill bottles is they have a notch that uh, we can take our rubber band now. Mm -hmm. I just shot across the room, um, <laughs> and got over another. And then you can tie it tight on there so that this isn't going to um, pull off when you actually go to fire it. Okay. All right. And then uh, we're going to take our scissors okay. and that excess um, junk mail. Right. <laughs> oh, I don't you have prettier colors. Those oh, are lovely. Love <laughs> Very oh. festive. And I love it. You So you're going to hole punch a bunch and uh, Mmm, a whole punch is such a good idea. Okay, does it matter the size of the confetti? No, not a, not at all. I um, what I'm cutting up is basically rectangles, um, because I like the way they flutter. So <laughs> in the air. <laughs> okay. That's true for confetti in the theater. Is that rectangles, um, and that are mylar work really well. They hang in the air, um, very well. Mm, like they, oh, interesting. So if there's a lot larger surface area, they'll catch more air on the way down. Yeah, it's it's interesting the difference between different like squares or rectangles, um, different colors. Uh, oh, different colors catching the light on the way down. That sounds like a collaboration with the lighting department. Yep, and the scenic department. Um, mm. Sound so that we can mask the sound of a confetti cannon with either um, an orchestra, music, uh, a, a wow. confetti cannon sound effect, if you want to have that, and to amplify the, the burst. Yeah, so, oh, cool. How many things have I never thought about? <laughs> all right, so, I've, got, I've got some confetti. How are you doing, Idabel? Me too. Yeah? Yeah. So we put it in the upside down pill bottle? Correct, so I have, the um, tie on the one end and then the open section, I'm gonna just drop in a bunch of confetti. Now you don't wanna fill it up to the top because you do wanna make sure that there's a little air and space in there 
for this confetti to um, come out. If you pack it too tightly, it just will stay inside. Okay. Okay. I think I'm ready to go. And then I once, really yeah, hmm? once once you have a a good amount that you don't mind cleaning up off your floor, then <laughs> we're good to go. Okay, in that case, I'm going to put exactly one piece of paper crumpled up, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> the funny thing okay. in building these, um, my kids discovered that you can put cork and cotton balls inside and shoot those around the room too. <laughs> oh, super fun! Okay, good. I, I need more things to clean up while I'm while I have something else to do. Um, okay, I think I'm I'm all ready. Do you got do you have yours ready, Annabelle? Yes. Cool. Oh, I'm so excited to see how yours works as a kind of a little dart. A blow dart thing. <laughs> um, so even though I know it's kind of a little bit silly, and I have never, I have yet to see somebody on a live stream successfully have multiple people sing or engage with music at the same time without a lag, I would like to suggest that we sing happy birthday to everybody at home. Uh, and then at the end, pull our, our, our birthday confetti cannons and see if they work. Does that sound okay? That sounds good. I'm going to enlist some help. <laughs> oh, amazing. So, hey, Anna, how are you? You can come in closer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So this is we are all ready to sing happy birthday. <laughs> That's so awesome. Okay, so even if there's a lag, we'll just sing loud and proud straight on through it. We're not going to worry <laughs> about the fact that we might not be saying the same words at the same time. Does that sound okay with everybody? Sounds great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you to our extra choir members. Okay, here we go. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear, dear Kyle. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. To you. <laughs> that was so cool. It totally worked. <laughs> Yay! Thank you to our extra helpers. That was amazing. I'm so happy they joined on. <laughs> more confetti there, Dave. <laughs> yep. Uh, that, I know what we're so cleaning fun. up today. That was so much fun. If you're home, we celebrate you and we honor you and thank you for letting us celebrate your birthday. And Dave, your birthday is also nearby, right? March 25th. March yeah. 25th. So this hey, is March awesome. 27th. No way. I didn't even plan that. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to both of you. And thank you both so, so much. Idabel, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming on and doing a theater activity. I love getting to see you. And I look forward to the next time that I get to see you in person, of course. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren David. All right. We'll see you next time. See you. And uh, so I want to take this opportunity now to check out the comments section and see if there are any questions and then we'll, we'll have, we'll be able to close it out for the day. But first, Dave, I want to mention a question that I have. I know that you mentioned that you studied sculpture, you got a BFA in sculpture, and now you're a prop master. And, I, and I'm wondering, does somebody need to study sculpture in order to be a prop director? No, not at all. Um, like I said before, um, the path of a lot of people within this uh, field Mm -hmm. is really a winding road and um so it it's not one that that dictates you need to have a degree um mm -hmm. really what you need to have is that love of building that love of creating and um and just seeing potential and okay. uh yeah okay i'm gonna send you all the kids i've ever babysat to, <laughs> to be your apprentices okay <laughs> but it seems like you you have enough apprentices <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. My youngest <laughs> so, son wants to be the best prop builder he can be. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm so glad that they got to get involved. Uh, one of the questions that we have from online is, are prop tables identified by actor or role? So is there one, ta one prop table for each major role or and shared ones for supporting characters? Or how, how are those prop tables divided by the actors? That's a good, uh, that's a good question. The, a lot of the times the space backstage is actually what's going to dictate what your prop tables look like. Mm -hmm. um, the key mm -hmm. to a prop table is making sure though that um, there's an order to the props that you have laid out. So if you have, um, from the start of the show, you want to make sure those props are closest to the stage and you kind of work away. Or mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you have an, an intermission, um, that may mean that you can actually have a, a prop table with a lid 
and then at intermission you can switch that and hide that prop table lid and then bring up a new tray slash lid mm -hmm. and have the act two props set um, sometimes major theaters um, you'll actually see they have a whole um, uh, conveyor belt that comes up and down and so they can load up props wow. and keep switching it during the show i'm like wow. it's <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> It's really detail amazing. oriented and meticulous to have everything yeah. in the same place at the same time, its own place for each thing. The big thing is, is making sure, I mean, oh, I like a prop table with labels so that who um, is handling that prop and what that prop was is labeled on the table. So you know mm -hmm. where to put it back when it's done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or when the show's done. So, yeah. Well, that's like exercising both parts of the brain. You have all these creativity um, approaches, creative approaches and, and then really uh, strict and rigid also organization skills coming into play. That's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> it is a battle of both brains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question is, if an item falls into multiple categories, like a sound, and, a sound item and a prop item, which is responsible for it? So maybe uh, who at the end of the day would be responsible for that item that was a collaboration between multiple departments? If um, if we're talking, I'm gonna I'm reading that question as in if the production's already started on stage, who's responsible for it? Because there mm. there's from the design concept and the production meetings, you're establishing who's responsible for the creation. Oh, I see. And then okay. when you get into the performance. Um, you have your team that's responsible for maintaining um, the props during that main that run, or you have your master electricians who are maintaining the lights, your sound um, masters mm -hmm. who are maintaining the sound um, and the speaker quality. So it it's um, our our uh, stage crew that's actually tied in so um, tightly mm -hmm. with the production. Yeah. They have a big part in maintaining um, the the day to day of the show. The nice thing is, uh, we, since we do work so closely, we can support each other. And because there's some things where you're like, okay, I didn't foresee that table breaking a leg during this performance. Yeah. My team can help and rebuild that. Um, really rapidly. If we need to, yeah. There, yeah. Being a prop master, you learn to make very quick fixes um, in seconds. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, this resourcefulness and in, in working on the fly has been so fun, even just planning our activities. So I'm seeing it come into play. Um, <laughs> somebody wants to know, what is the most difficult prop that you've ever built? Oh my gosh. Uh, the first one that comes to mind was a breakaway guitar um, that was based off a Picasso painting. And Ooh. it was for um, the show, Twyla Tharp's um, The Times Are Changing. And Santo LaCosta was the designer on that show, who was amazing. He, he was fantastic to work with, but he really let me as the prop artisan at that time kind of run with the design and create um, the look and create the way it would break apart. Mm. Um, and I would just show him if this was the right path and he completely went with my, uh, my take on it. So that was, that was challenging because when you're building a breakaway that has to break and then get put back together for a, the next performance within three hours it's wow. it's tricky <laughs> that's so cool though that's really awesome uh someone else wants to know what is the most difficult show that you've had to prop for and why hmm. um I, uh, I there's so many shows that pop in the head that there's challenges because um, yeah. within every show, you're going to have uh, some new challenge, which is uh, actually the blessing of what we do, because you're always challenging mm -hmm. yourself and learning something. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, that, one that was tricky that we had to work um, tightly with the designer was a show called Rain. Mm -hmm. um, and having to create lanterns that were on all these levels. It was a house that a four level house that rotated on stage. And then at intermission, it broke apart. And, and it had elements of rain uh, in the show. So you had to, um, at times, take into account that your props are going to get wet and um, that part of the set was going to have to get dismantled at intermission. And oh. so there are a lot of factors that, that had to go into play on how yeah. you worked with those props and then how you maintained it so it would uh, last the whole run of the show. 
So that was a good challenge. Sounds pretty elaborate, but it kind of sounds like the thing that you love most of all, like the, the challenge of all challenges to try to figure out how to make that work. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be a way. <laughs> <laughs> love the spirit. Love that spirit. Um, another question is, is doing props for theater different than for film and TV? Uh, yeah, I mean, even down to the terminology, there can be um, uh, a difference uh, within that. You'll hear terminology like hero prop and um, background props and things like that, which is not something that uh, when we're dealing with the show in the round, um, yeah. all yeah. of our props are hero props in that theater. And, um, huh. and, and uh, film um, has different uh, focuses. They have different departments. Um, the one thing that seems like it's a consistent thread is that you have a bunch of people who love to build and create mm -hmm. and um, also understand timelines, how you have to hurry up and wait at times where you're, you're building something that needed to be on stage or in film two minutes ago. And um, so you're using all your resourcefulness to get that prop on yeah. set or on stage. <laughs> I, I've actually never heard the term hero prop before. What does that mean? A, a hero prop is usually something in film that's going to be um, in view of the camera. Like you're going to see that mm. up close, um, they're they're going to take a shot of it, and so that hero prop may need to work or have details in it that are are more necessary than a stunt prop, which mm -hmm. um, could a stunt prop is going to be something that um, and it may be a gun, but a rubberized version of a gun so that um, a stunt actor can fall on it or can roll around mm. or throw it, and oh, okay. um, it's not going to break in the same way that a, a hero prop would. So there's definitely different details in um, whether it's a hero prop, a stunt prop, or just a background prop. Yeah, yeah, different restrictions. Whereas I guess on stage, it all has to do all of it. It all has to look super good and super real. It all has to work reliably and do exactly whatever its function is while also being able, being usable for the actors safely. In Not to theory, brag, yes. theater's pretty cool. <laughs> If you can accomplish all that, well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for accomplishing all of that on a, on a regular basis. And that that's Thanks, all the questions Beth. that we have from online. So I just want to say thank you again so much, Dave, for joining me today and for sharing your knowledge and your confetti cannon making abilities and your children's beautiful singing voices. Thank you so much. It was really yeah, nice to spend Much time better with than you. mine. <laughs> thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> thank you. I'll see you around soon, I hope. Yes. Uh, oh, you know what, Dave? I, if, can I actually oh. get Dave back for a second? I totally forgot. It's very important to do a checkout. We didn't do our project aware <sighs> style checkout. Can I, sorry, can I get one word to describe how you're feeling before you go? Um, inspired to keep creating. <laughs> mm, yeah, thank you. I, I also feel inspired to uh, to keep connecting, to keep connecting with other theater artists in different disciplines and with our community members, because moments like this are really fun where we get to celebrate each other and, and do kind of silly things just, just for the sake of connecting. So thank you. Okay, I'll let you go now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, and also thank you to you watching at home. These programs are made so much more wonderful by your very enthusiastic comments and participation in our prop quiz. If you end up making your own confetti cannon, please go ahead and send us pictures of that. We'd love to see whatever you're making at home. That's really resourceful in this, in this time. Uh, and if you also, if you want to support free accessible online theater programming just like this, uh, arts organizations around the country and around the world are fighting to keep serving our communities and coming out on the other side of this global crisis. So you can be a part of innovating the arts as a public service during this time. If you would like, go ahead and head over to theoldglobe.org slash donate if you want to contribute a few dollars or more. Uh, but thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you for being a part of our online digital journey. I will be here next Wednesday at 3 p.m. for our next workshop. But before then, if you want to jo join back tomorrow for another amazing playwriting workshop with Katie Haroff, we'll see you right here, 3 p.m. tomorrow for Community Voices. Thank you so much and happy birthday again to everyone whose birthday is happening right now. We'll see you next time. Bye.